Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name's Greg. I'm alcoholic. So that's good news. I know what's wrong. I, um... I can't tell you how touched I've been this weekend, uh, how much love I felt, and how many of you have come up and introduced yourself and started up a conversation, and uh, that really uh, does mean a lot to me and, and my wife. Uh, you know, as you travel around, and uh, doesn't matter how long you're sober, uh, when you're in a new group of people, there's always those moments of uh, feeling a little out of sorts, and they were short-lived here, believe me, they really were, and there's... A tremendous amount of love uh, in this room this morning, and I can feel it. Um, my home group is the uh, Language of the Heart group in Half Moon Bay, California. It is a great group, and it's a really crazy group. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you one example of it. Uh, it's a men's meeting. And uh, so when we formed the meeting, uh, we said, gee, we want to be an AA group. But if we're a men's meeting, that may exclude some people. And so we had this long, arduous debate to make sure that we complied with the third tradition, being open to anybody. And we came up to the conclusion, well, we're a men's meeting, and we really read from language of the heart, but anybody's welcome at our group. So if you're ever in that part of the world, and it's Tuesday night, you're welcome at my home group. I am... My sobriety date is uh, Valentine's Day, February 14th, 1978, and um, I uh, found sobriety on the island of Maui, and what's really amazing to me is uh, uh, prior to that, I was uh, a drinker that could not not drink, and I'll get into a little bit of more of that as I go on, but uh, I went to that meeting, and I haven't had a drink since, and I didn't go to there to that meeting. To get sober, I went there to get a wife back. Get, you know, I was living in my car, I was destitute, I lost everything. Else. And lo and behold, I haven't had a drink. So, if you're new to AA, uh, the good news is that you don't ever have to drink again, starting right now today, if you don't want to, because. Uh, Because the fact of the matter is there's a room full of people here that will go to hell and back again with you to help you not drink today. And bottom line, that's the steal in AA. We're a non-drinking fellowship of men and women who will go anywhere and do anything to help each other to remain that way in this 24 hours. So um, I, I really want to uh, echo what Mary said about the candy in the room and, oh my God, the silver spoon. I I was going to bring it out here. It's a big serving spoon, and I'm I'm sure everyone got one. And it's etched in native carvings, and it's got, if you look closely, it's got a little AA down in the middle of it, and and I can't, it's just a precious gift. And in my household, the door is always open. Whoever walks through the door sits at the table, and we eat. And drink coffee. And uh, so that's going to be part of our daily rituals to have that big serving spoon on our table. And I really appreciate your thoughtfulness as a committee to do that. Um, Archie, I know lots of accolades have been there. You know, this is a program of deflation of ego. (laughs) But I know how much it meant to everyone here in Vancouver that this uh, roundup be rejuvenated and I think you and your committee has done a super job. And Mary, she, uh, excellent hostess. Arrived at the airport, talking on her cell phone, <laughs> directing everybody coming out of internet. Walked right by her, she didn't even see me. <laughs> So I'm standing around there looking and kind of, you know, giving my AA smile. And <laughs> finally I go over and sort her out, and there she was. And, uh, and then she introduced me to Boyd. And Boyd, thank you so much for uh, looking after us. You really did a great job. Where are you, Boyd? Ah, good, good. Thank you. 
Thank you. One of the things that re- there are several things that really touched my heart this weekend, and I'm not going to go through the whole litany of it because that's all we talk about is my gratitude list today. But I, I do want to speak about Friday night. And Liz, uh, who gave it up for us Friday night, she's a dear friend of mine, and I've known her for quite a few years, and been in service with her, and I was manager of the office when she was appointed committee on the board, and it was so she really uh, participated well, really gave her heart out into the projects that the Trustees Literature Committee was preparing for the conference. And, uh, one of the things that happened, though, on that Friday night, and it's never happened to me, as you had this uh, wonderful countdown, there were 11 people with one day. I've never seen that before. 11 people with one day? And uh, there was this, this lady sitting in front of me, and I could tell she was brand new. I mean, she had a, a whiff of flavor. <laughs> it's kind of distinct. And, and she was quite emotional, and I could see uh, as she figured out what was going on, she was going to get up here on this stage, and oh my God. And uh, she did, and she got her big book, and she came and sat back down. The proceedings started, and I watched over her shoulder as uh, she cracked open that book, and she read a couple of uh, sentences, and then she just very gingerly rubbed her hand on the pages, just kind of caressed it. And, oh my God! I don't. I mean, she's totally unaware of what she was doing to me. But, oh, that's exactly how I felt about that book. I mean, that's where I had my first spiritual experience. And I didn't come from that world at all. Uh, And I had a hard time reading that book. And so, uh, 11 people, I prayed to God. Oh my God, I you can't, I thought about it all weekend. I just prayed to God there's 11 people in this room with three days of sobriety. Three days of God's gift for alcoholics that can't drink. But I want to I want to speak to those eleven people for a moment, because uh, you know you did that for me. Uh, my very first meeting I went to, like I said, uh, I wasn't coming here to get sober and have a transforming experience in life. I was coming here to get back to the house, get the wife back, uh, you know, find some money. I mean, it was just I was a wreck. I was a goner. I was at the point where I wanted to pull my trigger on the gun that I didn't have. Uh, But I was in that moment that we all have to get to. And it's so amazing. And what visionaries our founders were. They knew that I was going to have to get to that place where I would say the hardest thing that everybody has to say is, please help me, I can't stop drinking. AA works 100% of the time But that's one of those prerequisites. In order for AA to work for me, I had to reach out and say to another man, please help me. I can't stop drinking. And uh, thank God I did that that morning of February 14th. It uh, changed my life forever and ever and ever. And it has, as my drinking had such a negative ripple effect, in my family, in my community, in my surroundings, my sobriety has this positive, wonderful, loving, energetic effect. I uh, One of the founding principles in AA is anonymity. And uh, we have a tradition that speaks to anonymity, and it's 100% anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. I don't declare my membership nor show my face as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now for me, I also know that new people have to be afforded as much anonymity so that they can feel comfortable being with us. And we honor them and always give them that. But uh, for me, after I've been sober a while, I now want to shout from the treetops. I am not an anonymous person, believe me. Because uh, this is such a great message. It is absolutely something that moves mountains. I mean, 
and I know I'm speaking to the choir, <laughs> and, I, and I'm no different than you. And that's the thing that's so powerful about anonymity. It's our common malady and our common solution. Everything else doesn't matter. Every, everything doesn't matter. It doesn't care what kind of car you drove up in, where you live, who your, who your significant other is. It's this illness that you have, that I have, and our ability to relate at depth with that illness and to celebrate a common path, uh, walking a path of sobriety and sharing that message. So if you're new, I really want to explain to you, you got that book last night, and that's one of those great tools. Uh, when I went to that very first meeting after I surrendered that man, it was a step study group in, in uh, Maui, Hawaii, and uh, they had a newcomer, and so they stopped what they were doing, and they talked about step one, and everybody spoke to my heart. They absolutely pierced that steely armor with their words. They just pierced it. And uh, I remember at the end of the meeting, I was asked if I wanted to say something, and I said, my name is Greg, and I'm alcoholic. Now, as I shared yesterday in that service meeting, I was just mimicking what they were doing. I didn't know what alcoholism was. I didn't know any of that. And I surely wasn't a member of AA. I was a visitor. I was a newcomer. But just again for me, it was an admission that I needed help. By me saying I was alcoholic, I was crying out for help. And that group surrounded me, and they nurtured me, and they cared me. But they did two things for me that I know... Uh, is why I stand here today before you sober, a sober man that's on a path of enlightenment. They made sure I had that book, Alcoholics Anonymous, and they didn't let me leave that room without a sponsor. They didn't let me leave that room without a sponsor. Can't underscore how important that is if you're new to AA. And if you're sitting in this audience this morning and uh, you don't have a book, I'll, I'll get you one. If you don't have a sponsor, you got to get one. It's the same thing. You ask for help with your drinking. You ask for help with how, learning how to live life free from alcohol. And that's the promises that AA gives me, is that uh, they're going to teach me how to live life free, happily and joyously free from alcohol. And that's the good news. That is absolutely the good news. So if you want to... Change your life 180 degrees and start uh, enjoying the realm of the Spirit. I really encourage you to do those two things today. Um, the other thing that uh, struck me uh, was during that service meeting, and uh, uh, the topic really was, I think Jamie expressed it, that what shape is your triangle in? And I, and I mentioned something like that and I shared a few minutes. And it's still resonating with me because uh, I thought about it and I did, some, I did some searching in the last day or two. And I think my triangle's in pretty good shape. Uh, I think my recovery, I, I think I'm, I'm recovered and continuing to enjoy an, an ever-unfolding life. I absolutely celebrate and know how intricately, intricately uh, those principles and the traditions are to my group's recovery and the ability for it to do 12-step work. And, and the concepts for world service, it's really it's how we uh, carry this beautiful message outside of our groups and outside of our families to the, to the world abounding and how well we are walking big book for our community. So I think I think it's pretty good. And I do believe that uh, the three legacies of Alcoholics Anonymous is the program. And it took our founders uh, 28 years to finish memorializing it in writing. And all of those, all of those principles, all of the things that are interwoven within those uh, Concepts and traditions and principles are all related principles that enable AA to continue to fulfill its mission, which was read this morning, to ensure that AA is here 
for future generations. I um, want to talk a little bit more about uh, a home group and what it's meant to me. It, uh, it's really the base of everything in AA. I know lots of people that uh, come to AA, me included, knowing nothing about how dynamic the home group is going to be in my life. Uh, but it has really gotten to the place where it has uh, it has been everything that I've ever yearned for in life. It's a place where that I can go and I can walk in the room and sit down in a chair and take a deep breath and for one hour or an hour and a half turn my head off. It gets quiet. It goes away. Because for that hour, I'm thinking about you. And that's really my experience in working through these legacies. All of them are about taking away this inward reflection that I am sick with. Francine talked about it this morning. It's so great. And it's about an outward reflection. I am, I've always had the steps in my life. I continue, I just finished another fifth step, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. But I want to tell you what the end result of my applying those principles in my life, what I've come to. And it's very simplistic. Uh, I believe, for me, that the design of life, the very essence of life, for every human on the planet, Every single thing is to be in love and to give service. It's that simple. It makes so much sense to me in my way of life that that's what we're supposed to do, whether we're in AA or not. When, when uh, I mean, I drank alcohol for the effect produced by alcohol. Oh my God, it gave me the personality change I crave. I didn't want to be me. And, I, and I'm, uh, I guess I can some people call them and or other subject. I mean, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a druggie. I, you know, I'm from the 60s. I had long hair, and it, it got me out of me. I ate it or smoked it or did whatever it was to it. <laughs> but that didn't put me where I wanted to be. Alcohol turned on my light switch. Drugs just put me in the corner vegetating. Yeah, they physically <laughs> strung me out, but they didn't give me that nirvana I was looking for. Uh, AA gives me a very similar effect. When I'm looking outward towards you, oh my God, I can't tell you the effect. Uh, that hole in my stomach is gone. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity, that feeling of self-centered fear, the, the feeling that it is all about me, absolutely is gone. And it's the place that I try to be in more times than not. I'm going to talk a little more, a little more about that uh, a little later. But I do want to tell you about that I am a drunk. And uh, I love what booze did for me in the beginning. It absolutely created a world that was magical to me. I, and and uh, here in this first, in this... Uh, Last fifth step. So I'm sober 33 years, and I have uh, been doing the steps over and over and over for all these years. And I tried to extract those principles, look at them in different ways, and apply them to my life. And it was just in this last uh, 12 months I've discovered some tidbits about me that are so meaningful. They've been buried way deep down inside me, and I'm still not through processing them. And that was that I, I uh, the effects of my being a 12 or 13 year old when I started drinking, and the effects of having a, a family break up during that time, and you know, stiff upper lip and didn't affect me at all. And, oh God, it was tragic in my life. And I'm just starting to get in touch with those feelings. And it was during the time that I was uh, abused by an uncle. And, uh, and actually, I'm looking at it now, my God, I, I prostituted myself. And I, I, you know, he'd buy me booze, and I'd allow him to use my body. And, uh, you know, I 
stuffed all that down inside me because it was so painful. And so what I'm trying to, to really relate to is this unfolding of grace continues. And it's all about me being able to look down inside and search. Know that every everything that's happened in my life is going to touch somebody else. It's going to have a positive effect on somebody else. The first time I uh, drank alcohol, uh, it was uh, I was off uh, on a little summer vacation with mom. They were divorced and we were going somewhere and I didn't want to go and I was going to make her life miserable and so I pouted the whole time and just caused havoc and we went and visited some relatives somewhere and I got caught up with some older boys under the house and they were having a drinking party and uh, they were taking a beer, they were drinking beer and they were putting it in shot glasses and you had to have a shot glass of beer every minute. And if you ever tried that experiment, you get a buzz pretty quickly. And so as uh, that started warming up inside of me, and those walls started melting, it wasn't too long that I was bonded with these boys. Oh my God, they were my long lost brethren. I was <laughs> laughing with them. Oh God, it was so great. I never felt that because before, I was always so lonely and so frightened. I was scared to death of people. I didn't know how to handle emotions. My God, when a woman would cry or a man would cry or there'd be a fight or there'd be any kind of show of uh, outbreak of emotion, I would turn tail and run. It was just too real for me, too frightening. And here I found the magic elixir. And the fact of the matter is, the reason I drank from there until I was 31 years old, I wanted to relive that feeling of release. That's the only reason I drank. To go to that feeling was so powerful in my life. And from that day forward, I drank as much as I could. And uh, I already uh, had started acting out my very uh, bad time uh, staying out of jail. I mean, I was in jail when I was 13 and 14 and 15, and all of us surrounded alcohol and bad behavior. And I started uh, doing things that I was ashamed of. I started blacking out. I mean, every time I would come to in the morning, uh, whether I did something wrong or not, I had this immense feeling of shame. Even days that it was great, I had this immense feeling of shame, like I didn't belong on planet Earth. Somehow, uh, my wires were broken. They didn't connect. My feel-good wires, anything about me that I, the view of me was always in a negative light. So alcohol worked great for me. I, I got, I born and raised in L.A., and I got into so much trouble that I found myself one more time before the Superior Court of Los Angeles, and they figured that I was going to do some uh, serious jail time this time, but uh, Mom had a good lawyer, and uh, we figured out a deal where I would be barred from living in L.A. County. <laughs> and so uh, they shipped me off to San Diego to live with her, and uh, my address really was south of the border some in Tijuana. And uh, I started that same kind of pattern. Drinking, using people, and getting in lots of trouble. I happened to be at the racetrack one day. I was 17 years old and put two bucks on an egg and won 75 bucks and jumped on a plane and went to Hawaii. And uh, ended up on Maui and uh, it was so much. Oh, talk about a spiritual experience. I, <laughs> it was 1967. I arrived in Lahaina, Maui, and uh, they were reenacting the whaling spree. Now, that used to be the capital of Hawaii, and uh, there would be, in the day, there would be lots of these square riggers anchored out front, and the sailors would be getting all grobbed up, and there would be uh, naked Hawaiian women on the beach, and there would be a huge party, and it, they were reenacting that, and they'd put roadblocks on both ends of town to keep cars out, no cars allowed, and it was a four-day drunk when I arrived. It was, I never went up, it was great. I, uh, I changed islands now and then, but uh, 32 years later, I was still in Hawaii. 
And that's where the uh, worst part of my drinking happened. That's where I got into the type of drinking that becomes very dark, very extremely dark. And, and a terrible thing happened. I married a gal, and we had a son, and I didn't belong in a marriage. I wasn't, uh, wasn't a husband. I wasn't a father. I knew nothing. I had none of those skills. You know, I stopped growing when I was 12, so I didn't, I never matured. And, uh, and then, you know, I'm one of those uh, people that got, I kept crashing cars and breaking things and, I came to one morning in a cane field and the floorboard of my car and I'd been involved in a head-on accident and the other guy had died. And, uh, I remember the tragedy surrounding that and I'm off to the hospital and uh, learning about the death. And, oh my God, it just broke my heart I, to take somebody's life uh, with my car in a blackout. And I remember, once again, Swearing off that I will never, ever drink again. This is it. This is absolutely it. And I meant it. Way down in here I meant it. But I'm alcoholic, unbeknownst to me. And uh, I'm drunk within 24 hours. And I continued to drink uh, around the clock for the next seven years. And it got very dark. And thank God that family left me. Thank God they moved away from me. And... And eventually I found myself in that car on the beach wanting to commit suicide. Well, uh, so I got to that place where I was willing to ask for help. And things were just, it was amazing, that, that surrender. I, I, uh, I got a book and I got a sponsor and I got directions. And the directions were, you start on this page here and you read all the way over to this page at the back and then you hold it back and you start reading again <laughs> and uh, I'll tell you when to stop <laughs> so I had very firm instructions now um, I wasn't able to read much or comprehend very little but uh, my first sober uh, experience was when I read that part of the book that talked about alcoholism being an allergy and so here I'm hearing these words and I'm saying and I'm going Oh my God, I'm not a bad person. I have an illness. And you know, when they wrote the book, they didn't, they hadn't figured out it was a disease yet. It was just an illness. And I had an illness. I had an allergic reaction when I put booze inside me. I developed this phenomena of craving. I couldn't stop. And it just went on. And to boot, I was absolutely insane. It was that that moment of insanity leading up to rationalizing, well, this time it'll be different. This time I won't end up in jail. This time I'll be able to stop. This time, I mean, that was the insanity. That was where that step two really came home for me. Is that it's always that insane moment prior to that first drink that got me in trouble. And I could not, not pick up that drink. I just couldn't. And so then here I end up with this group of people, and all of a sudden, day two, I'm not drinking. So what's different? I'm with people that want to learn how to live life without drinking, and we help each other. It was just monumental, so simplistic, but so monumental. That's why when people come and go and they have sobriety and they leave, and uh, it's always the same story when I ask, well, I stopped going to meetings, I got disconnected, I stopped working the steps, I stopped doing these things that are healthy for me. And so I listen very well when I hear those things. I listen very well. And the reason that uh, I've been able to do it is because it's only in a 24-hour segment. I only got to do what's asked of me today, just today. I was very fortunate uh, getting sober in Maui at the time, and uh, they were going through a big metamorphosis of their service structure. They were uh, like here in uh, in Vancouver, you have an inner group that does a lot of services and a helpline and they distribute literature and they do all that stuff. And 
in Hawaii at the time, they didn't have any general service conference structure. They just always were very happy with an inner group. And one of the delegates came home from a conference and said, gee, we ought to start a general service conference structure here in Hawaii. And so I was, uh, you know, very new in sobriety and I got involved in that. And I tell you, I learned so many lessons how people would make sacrifices. I mean, that's really the underpinning principle behind all of our traditions, right? The humility behind making sacrifices for the good of the whole. And so these uh, vested interests in intergroup that they had had for many years, they slowly passed them off to this upstart general service structure. And it was really done with uh, lots of love and lots of dedication. And so I was part of that. And I think that adds a lot to the why I'm, uh, I grew up with three legacies in my life. I just didn't get sober and got some magical point and said, oh, now I'll start looking at the tradition. And then I did that for a while, and then I'll start looking at the world service and concepts. I, I was taught all of that. I was taught the program of AA, and the compass was all of that, and it's all right now. Uh, my uh, third meeting of AA, they went on a 12-step call. I had a lot to give. I knew how not to drink for three days. That's a powerful message for someone who's trying to get one day. So my growing up in Hawaii was very, uh, very needed. And I got extremely involved in AA service. Uh, as uh, Mary said, I, be I became a delegate in the 80s and a trustee in the 90s and then a general manager of your general service office in the decade of 2000. And those experiences of uh, serving the fellowship were but I'll talk about it at the end of uh, my talk. I want to talk a little bit now about uh, the steps. And uh, Dick, thank you for what you did last night. You really brought the principles and those steps alive. I, uh, I I read a book. In the beginning, my sponsor would just let me read the big book. In fact, he told me, when he told me to start one page and read back, he said, I don't want you reading magazines, I don't want you watching TV, I don't want you watching, uh, listening to radio. This is about sobriety, you just read this book. And uh, after I'd read it long enough, he said, okay, here's the next one, and it was A, It Comes of Age. And uh, as I struggled through that book, and struggled through it, it was so dry. But eventually I had changed enough that it became a, just a wonderful history book of the first 20 years. And it was really within that book that I found God. That I absolutely saw the works of God active in those uh, founders' lives. And really, time after time after time again by the storytelling, they should have screwed this deal up. But at the last minute, uh, power greater than themselves would swoop in and save the day. And uh, so that was my first introduction to a God of my, my own understanding. And... Uh, I didn't grow up with uh, any religious training. Uh, I was one of those that uh, stood in contempt uh, of anybody that had a religious background. I thought you were men and women that were weak, and you were, you know, trying to save the, the world, and you know, I just it repulsed me. And I was one of those people that would debate the existence of God or the non-existence of God, and I had uh, I would come from a place of ignorance in my debate, and I'm sure it was self-aware to everybody in the conversation. So, just like the book says, you know, my pathway to uh, embracing uh, a God of my own understanding was probably fairly easy, but I was so embarrassed. Um, and I started out my search. I started out searching in uh, meetings in the park that were, uh, you know, they would have some religious functioning, and I would go sit behind a palm tree within earshot of the minister and kind of listen and try to sort things out. And then eventually I uh, graced the halls of uh, some church and listened intently. And, Finally, I found a way for me that uh, really enlightened me and started me on a path. And that's called the 12 steps. And uh, when I did that third step, uh, 
what really stuck out, struck out for me is that second sentence in that prayer, relieve me of the bondage of self, that I may better do thy will. And next, take away my difficulties, that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help. For how in the way of life. I mean, that was my first introduction to knowing the self-centeredness. Self-centered fear was the root of my problem. And that I was petitioning, as Dick said, it's really just a decision. But that within that prayer, I was petitioning to have this character defect removed. And it was not for me. I was doing it for you. And uh, I figured that out, and uh, the joy that came into my heart. And then when I looked at the next couple of proposals, they were lying the same way, four, five, and six. And in the seven, that prayer in seven, you know, to become a maximum service to God and my fellows. Again, it was shaping me so that I could love and serve you. Similarly, in the eighth and ninth step, that's amending my past, so that I can rid myself of these uh, instincts that have been blocking me from you, that have been keeping me from being in love with you and serving you. And uh, a beautiful eleven step. I uh, my life has changed quite a bit in the last couple of years. It kind of slowed down. Um, I've always been able to sit quietly with myself and to turn off the noise. But I'm able to do it now, I think, at a deeper level. I discovered one more time that they added some words to some of the literature I read. And uh, in the 12 and 12 and the 11 step, uh, there's a wonderful uh, paragraph in there that talks about self-examination, prayer, and meditation. And that when they're interwoven, it creates an unshakable foundation for life. Now, I used to do my 10th step separately. Uh, but in the last uh, year or so, I am doing this uh, self-examination in the morning with paper and pen. And I'm examining things. And I'm taking my day, my 24 hours, uh, to God in prayer. <coughs> And then sitting quietly and listening for directions. And then doing what I think would fit his will for me today. And I must tell you, it is uh, an astounding revelation for me. It's astounding. I, um, when I was ten years sober, uh, I was, the first five years of my sobriety, I was ashamed to be uh, alcoholic. And I think I mentioned uh, yesterday in the meeting, it wasn't until I was about five years sober that I really became a member of AA. Although I've been a GSR and a DCM by now, and I'm back there, but I was only active with you. As soon as I walked out those doors, I was ashamed and I didn't want anybody in my community to know that I was sober. Because <laughs> they might judge me. You know, the hell with what they had saw my actions in my drinking career, but I was so ashamed of my inability to control my drinking. And uh, thank God that left me around, around about my fifth year of sobriety. And I started looking at life anew. Read this book right about that time. It was written by a, a member in Florida, and it's just titled Twelve. And it's a little short booklet, and it's his interpretation of the 12 steps in year 1, year 7, and year 14. And uh, there are three distinct different articles on how those steps uh, have worked in that person's life and how they've applied them. And that's been my experience. But at year 10, I found that uh, my heretofore uh, connection with God. And it came really uh, quite sudden. It came sudden that morning that I woke up in bed and God was on my lips. My first thought of the day was of a creative intelligence. And I sat up in bed 
And for the next so dozen years, it was like that way. Then one morning, it was gone. It left me. And for the next four or five years, I struggled. I searched every single day to refine me to connection. And then I came to the understanding that it never left. I just changed. I moved. And there was nothing wrong with me moving and evolving. In fact, that was the nature of searching. You know, the 11th step tells me, you know, I don't find anything. I just search. And I continue to search and search. It continues to unfold for me. I, um, I believe that uh, alcoholism in my life is probably a little bit hereditary. I probably learned to. The um, greatest thing I ever found in AA is that nobody can uh, you know, tell anybody that you're a drunk or you're an alcoholic. We all got to come to that realization ourselves. That's why we welcome everybody in here. Come on in, sit down, listen. You know, you'll know if you belong or not. If not, go on your merry way. And I think in AA today, we're finding that we've been so successful in raising the bottom that we have lots of visitors coming to AA that are scarcely potential alcoholics. And all of that's good. None of it's bad because we have this, we welcome people to come and be with us and to discover whether they uh, have this illness or not. I, uh, my mom, uh, I believe, was alcoholic. My uncle was in AA. My dad was a uh, heavy drinker. So I think I may have been predisposed to a lifestyle and maybe even uh, a gene. I, I don't know. It really doesn't matter. But it leads me to start thinking about my children and their children, your children, the predisposition and what am I doing about it? You know, how am I ensuring that the hand of AA continues to be outstretched for the yet unborn alcoholic? Am I doing my part? Am I showing up every day? Am I giving into AA? And that's why when I evaluated my triangle, how is my triangle today? I think it's fairly good because uh, I kind of devoted my life to AA. I learned early on that what I do is every day uh, I come to and thank my God for uh, another day, another opportunity, and I figure out first thing in the morning what meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous I'm going to today. And I plan my day around that meeting. Now, I'm kind of blessed if I go to four meetings a week. You know, if that's how my day turns out, I'm really joyful. If there's more, that's great. But I still plan my day around that meeting. I've done that for many, many years. And it just seems my days always unfold well if I have a focus on AA. I talked a little bit about uh, being a general manager. And I'm going to tell you three quick stories. And, you know wind it up. But, you know, what goes on in my home group is very important. We do 12-step work in our area, and, and it's the same thing, and everything we do is about carrying the message, reaching out. And, uh, you know, our responsibility pledge says anyone anywhere who reaches out. And so, yeah, that's in Half Moon Bay, California, and it's in California, and in the States, and Canada, and Russia. It's, it's around the world. I am responsible now, obviously, I can't be in Indonesia today, or I can't be over here, but there's things that I can do as a member of AA to ensure that the hand of AA is available. I can do my part, whether it's in prayer, whether it's in participating in my group, whether it's just elevating my awareness about the depth and breadth of Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, AA is in over 190 countries around the world today. There's a presence of it. But I don't know how many countries there are. Maybe 210. I think the Olympic Committee says there's 212. Maybe there's 215. You know, country today goes away tomorrow. But the fact of the matter is there's 6 billion plus alcoholics on planet Earth. And, you know, everybody's got their number, their percentage uh, in their mind of 
how many of those people might have this illness. And, you know, whatever your percentage is, do a little multiplication. And you're going to come up with a very large number of people that may have this illness. And so I ask myself, what am I doing about it? Well, I've been very fortunate uh, to be in a position for a while where I could do something about it. And one of the things we did on your behalf as the, the general service office is that in, uh, in 19, uh, I mean in 2000, we had an international convention in Minnesota and we had invited uh, uh, about half a dozen psychiatrists from Beijing to come and be with us at the international convention. We had been in contact with those psychiatrists for a little bit and they had told us how there were many, many, many failures that happened at their uh, Beijing Medical University and that they had a program of working with alcoholics and their families and they used uh, psychiatric tools and they used role modeling and they used therapy and they did all kinds of stuff and yet when they were done after a year and they would release them, they'd be drunk within a week. So they came to our convention and uh, several of the board members talked to them and uh, uh, visited them. I went to Beijing and met with uh, a couple other trustees went and we met with them and uh, they started instituting AA within their facilities. And magically, people started staying sober. They had the same year program, but they introduced the 12 steps and they started staying sober. And it wasn't long afterwards that the first uh, uh, Chinese uh, group got sober. I mean, there had been AA groups in Beijing for a long time, but you needed to have a passport to get in. Yeah. And if you were a Chinese nationalist, you weren't welcome because you didn't have a passport. And uh, the same story uh, repeated. Uh, and, and this is one of the things that I, in our ability to reach out, happens a lot through our friends that are non-alcoholic, your physician. How many of you have disclosed your physician if you're an AA member, or to your cleric, or your priest, or to your educator? How many of you disclosed that? Well, the fact of the matter is, lots of AA meetings are started around the world by non-alcoholic professionals that are exposed to us and say, oh my God, this is a life-changing experience for people that suffer from alcoholism. Uh, AA has developed many friends over the years, and we have uh, friends with the State Department. And lots of professionals come into the United States and into Canada uh, uh, doing research and looking at models of healthcare systems that are currently practiced. And one such group uh, came from uh, the Republic of Tuva in uh, Siberia. In uh, there was about 14 or 15 of them and a couple of political guys from the Russian Duva. And uh, they really besieged us after we met with them and told them what AA is and what it's not. And they wanted a visit uh, because during the Russian uh, USSR uh, occupation, they just decimated their entire civilization with free vodka and continued on. So uh, we did a little 12-step uh, call and went to Tuva, the city of Kazul, and found everything they said, and we met with the prime minister, and we met with the generals and the business leaders and the psychiatrists, and, and eventually a meeting was started in uh, one of their psychiatric hospitals. And, you know, you plant those seeds, and all of a sudden uh, another AA group is happening inside, and then it gets outside, and it starts... Mushroom. The last story that I think is really meaningful uh, to me on how much work we have to do uh, is in Kuwait. In, uh, in that part of the world, there's, you know, you don't, uh, you know, alcohol and alcoholism, there's parts of the Middle East where you can be lashed if you even talk about consuming alcohol or drinking, or if you're even in recovery. And so it's fairly secretive, and mostly in the expat communities. And uh, we had a, uh, we were invited to be there for a, a meeting, and it was really interesting. We'd have all the literature out on a table, 
And when we had a break, we had to cover it with a blanket in case uh, somebody walked into the room because the hotel we were in may get in a lot of trouble if they knew they were allowing an AA meeting to happen. Part of the, uh, the program was that uh, members in the community had invited their physicians to come. And so we delivered a presentation to them on what AA is, what it's not. And uh, after we were done, we invited some of the professionals to respond. And so this is in like 2005, 2006, and uh, here's some physicians that had never heard of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now we have lots of literature, lots of pamphlets, trans, uh, you know, in uh, Farsi and in uh, Arabic, and so this, this, the information's out there, but here's physicians, trained physicians, they've never heard about us. And they were so joyed to find out, oh my God, there's a solution, a tool that I can take into my clinic. I share these with you just for the, uh, just to share with you that our work, my 12-step work, is never done. There's so many opportunities. Now, my biggest fear, uh, always has been in sobriety, is uh, that I may decide uh, I can drink safely again and pick up that first drink. You know, it's a day at a time. Uh, and my fear is that I won't ever be able to get back here. And I won't be able to kill myself. And I have to live that way for the remainder of my life. I happen to know a couple people like that. And uh, they've been out there for 20 plus years. Died a couple of times, had the heart, the heart restarted, and they look very old and decrepit and just a shell of a person. Uh, I pray that doesn't happen to anybody in this room. I pray that you've made a decision today to stay sober and uh, continue to do that for your tomorrows. I talked about uh, maybe it might be a little hereditary. Uh, I have a couple of children. My other fear is uh, that those kids may develop active alcoholism. Now, I know where I've been and what I've done, and uh, I just can't even envision my kids selling their fanny on the street or being locked up or doing the things I did. I mean, as a parent, that would just absolutely break my heart. And I know I'm talking to a lot of parents, and I know you feel the exact same way. And the only thing that gives me solace, the only thing that really gives me strength is knowing that you're out there. Because you ought to know that I will go anywhere and do anything to help somebody if they want to stop drinking. Your children, their children. And I know you feel that way about my children if they have to go down that path. And that's the thing, the beauty about AA is that together we can. I can't do it by myself. And that this fellowship uh, is the most wonderful thing that's ever happened in my life. I want to really thank all of you for my surprise. God bless you and keep you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.